Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, musical entrepreneur, coffee brewer, and legendary metal drummer, Charlie Benante. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. It's another edition of the Rich Redmond Show coming to you today from three cities, Los Angeles, California, South 65, Nashville, Tennessee, somewhere in the Chicagoland area. My uh, my my guest, Jim, I know you're so excited about this. And we should be excited about this, man. We have rock and roll royalty in the house today, hailing from the Bronx. Where? This young man has done 37 years as the drummer uh, for American thrash metal band Anthrax, our new friend, Charlie Benante. How are you, buddy? Hey, guys. How are you? Thanks Good for you. Yeah, thanks for being here today. We were talking off camera about all of our things that we love, Marvel, Jaws, all the movies that came from the 1970s. We stood on line to see all these things. Crazy. We have so much in common, man. Bridges over Madison well, County. I mean, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> the notebook. <laughs> yeah. Such a, su- such a great action packed flick. That one was, oh, oh man. But it, every time it'll bring you to tears. And it's one of those ones kind of like Shawshank redemption. If it's on, I'm watching it. Alien one, 1977 Sigourney Weaver kills the monster. She still has her cat. I'm watching that one. I'm watching Pappy on. These are my gu- guilty pleasures, man. If they're on, I got to watch them. And you know what the funniest thing I, I, I would say this all the time. It's like you, you, you build your, your DVD collection, you know, you're so proud of it and it's, they're all on the wall over there and they sit there and then it's on television and you watch it, <laughs> you know, it's like all your, you got all the movies that you yeah. ever wanted to see, but yet it's on free. I'm going to watch it. I know. Let it's me so- ask you this. Yeah. Do you go and, and, you know, I know I have this on DVD, but I'll just spend the three bucks and rent it. Do you do that too? Um, well, I can tell you this. I, I'm stupid enough to have bought Star Wars probably 20 something times <laughs> because it comes out on a steel box or it comes out on but, Blu-ray or yeah. it comes out with special special uh, you know edition. So I'm a sucker for Star all Star Wars stuff. drink coaster. Yeah. yeah. I think I've probably spent more money on Star Wars and Kiss uh, that out of everything because I, I buy two of everything. It's like that, that thing. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, when we were on the road, like coming up, you know, our little combo that's been playing together for 21 years, man, in those early days, you know, when you're doing six shows a week, two on Sunday for the, you know, for the, for the festival crowd, you know, you stop at Walmart in the, in the middle of the night and you go to the bargain bin and you're like, Oh, I'm going to pick up this new horror film. And you, cause I have all these DVDs. I don't even have a DVD player anymore, man. Everything is so virtual. I drank the Kool-Aid like the kids. I got Spotify. I did it. Man. I know. I, you know, you have to join now. I mean, I remember back in the day when, when we would have tons of movies on the bus and, uh, the, the like certain movies would be on loop. To over and over again, like Goodfellas would be in the front lounge, back lounge, in the bunks. It would yeah. just be everywhere, you know. So you, you start to watch these movies and then you just recite these uh, lines, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it becomes part of your vernacular. And it's just like, you know, uh, that's what it was to be on tour. You just watch movies on long bus drives. Yeah. I mean, for us, it was in the early days, it was uh, Anchorman. Um, and old school, you know, so like, you know, Will Ferrell for sure. Great movies. Great yeah. movies, man. Yeah. Now, Charlie, do you, do you have your Benante's blend? Do you got your Benante's blend going on or what, what, what's going on? I, I don't have it with me right now, but yes, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I still do uh, my, my coffee, which is like one of my favorite things ever because it comes from the heart and it's yeah. just one of the greatest tastes that you could ever taste is my coffee. Um, but yeah, so I, I've been doing this for about uh, close to 15 years now, actually. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and now I do it with uh, uh, this company here in Chicago, dark matter coffee, which is great people. And uh, they put out the blends. Nice dark matter. And it's even got like a comic book metal slant to it. 
Exactly. <laughs> Jim, are you a coffee guy? Because, you know, like I, I drink coffee. Okay, because I never There's, like. We had, we had, you know, two hard rock heavy metal drummers that are coffee aficionados. The other being uh, Ray Luzier. Yeah. Who uh, has got corn coffee. Corn coffee. Have you tried them? Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know they had coffee either. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try it. Yeah. It's corn. Corn well, coffee, you know, coffee spelled with a K. And he gave me some, and I brought it out on the road because my drum tech has got like one of these, he's got all these beakers and grinders and blenders, and he's <laughs> back there like a hipster, you know, without the mustache and the corduroys, like making some some beans back there. And so I said, we're going to drink this corn coffee. And then COVID happened. And so now it's like out there in a road case somewhere. I can't get to oh, it, no. Matt, you know? Yeah. But you got to get to it. <laughs> So what we, was that? We got to try your coffee for sure. Yeah, we definitely have to try the coffee, man. And so, but the, and they have different uh, levels, right? You got Cafe Coretto, the Devil, you know, they all got cool names, right? Well, so the two blends, the Schism blend and the Devil, you know, that's more of like a light roast and a dark, dark roast. Ah. And then the the Cafe Coretto, that's uh, infused with uh, Frenette Branca, which is a nice uh, little digestive. <laughs> um, yeah. So normally coffee does go right through you, but with the Cafe Coretto, it'll go through you faster. <laughs> <laughs> Coming out which <That's>, end? <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Just one. So, so uh, what part of Ireland are you from? <laughs> I'm not, so uh, I'm, I'm saying I'm with an Italy. obvious Italian last name. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, you have that's a big family from, a, from Italy? I'm from Dublin, Italy. And, um, Dublin, Italy. Uh, I have, um, yeah, I'm from, uh, from Italy, uh, half Sicilian, <laughs> um, which is, uh, probably where my temper comes from, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't cross and Charlie. Yeah. I don't see you having it. I mean, every time you see you in interviews, you're just a, just a sweet dude, man. I mean, it's, it's hard to believe you might even have a temper. Oh, I kid around, but you know, <laughs> like everyone else, once you push it, you know, it's like yeah. the David Banner thing, you know? You don't want to make me mad. You know. <laughs> uh, you like me when I'm angry. It's right. like I've like never seen, I don't angry. think I've ever seen you angry, Rich. Um, you really get angry, do you? Yeah, usually, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at trying to stay in the land of unicorns and rainbows. But I mean, this, this, you know, this last seven months has been kind of trying, you know. I mean, this things just happen to us because of the, res of it's a manifestation of what's happening in the world, man. We carry it around with us a little bit. I've been, and you know, about Charlie, I've been, you know, I get a good out and get my five mile run. I look at the palm trees, you know, I try to get, pick up the sticks every day and you're prolific as hell, man. You write the majority, a lot of the music for the band. Am, am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. I do yeah. a lot of the, the music for the band. Um, it's uh, to me, uh, it's very important uh, because uh, I wake up with something in my head yeah. uh, every day or I'll be driving somewhere and I hear something like today. I was driving my daughter to to the store and I had this idea in my head. So just started humming it into my phone. And then later on, I'll take it and kind of like, you know, take it from here to the guitar and then yeah. put it, put a little riff out, you know? So I, I love doing it. And during this whole quarantine thing, I was doing these quarantine jams that I started mm -hmm. doing back in February because I was getting so depressed. Ah. watching watching the news and uh had to stop i just had to stop and you know be creative again if i can't be in front of people playing uh at least i could do this and kind of entertain myself while entertaining others and just make these videos and put them out and it's, it's just fun i got my friends to do it from yeah. other bands and it's been that's been kind of like a silver lining mm -hmm. yeah to do that I think it's I've so powerful that you play guitar and the fact that you can bring that to the table, um, you know, because my, you know, I'm just not that good at the guitar. I mean, the fact that you're so good at it, you can bring that to the table. It's great because you have so much uh, to bring to the other guys in the band. So it's just cool democratic process. Hey, check this out. And don't even get me started with the intellectual property and the publishing. Not a lot of drummers have that. That's a great thing to have. You're sleeping and you're making money. Yeah, right. Um, but that's that's the thing about uh, back in the day when I just I taught myself how to play guitar because the things that I was hearing in my head, I couldn't convey it through the drums. Sure. Uh, so I had to teach myself to play guitar. And um, 
And then, you know, uh, keyboards, it's, it's a hard instrument, man. And it it's is. like, I really try and do it as much as I could, but, uh, guitar just came easier to me. It's great, yeah. man. It's, uh, it, it's as a drummer, it's tough to pick up another instrument for sure. I mean, cause we're just used to, you know, four limb independence and stuff like that. But it's every time I've tried to pick up the guitar, it's just no go. I just can't figure it out. Yeah. It's just getting past that frustration barrier. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you can learn by like ACDC records, you know, because that's mm-hmm. kind of how I did it, you know, in Kiss records. And and then I kind of moved up to playing like, you know, Zeppelin, you know, and then Sabbath, you know. And then before you know it, it's like, oh, okay, I think I got the hang of this. And, um, and you know, to this day, I'm still learning. Even yeah. drumming, I'm still learning. I mean, I'll... I'll be inspired by someone who I didn't think could inspire me because I've never heard of them and I'll watch something and I'll be like, what the hell? You know, like, wow, wow. yeah, that's great. I didn't, I would have never thought of going there. You know, those type mm-hmm. of things always make my head spin. Well, how did it start comes for you, to Charlie? Mind? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. What comes to mind? Like, uh, for example, like uh, um, just, just an odd influence that comes to mind that you remember. People don't, all right, so I'm like probably one of the biggest Dave Matthews fans that there wow. is. Uh, I love Dave Matthews. I love uh, – uh, I'll go see Dave Matthews every summer if I'm home. Really? I'll, I'll try and go to multiple shows uh, thanks to my friend Anthony, who is the production manager. But really got to know those guys. And I feel after a Dave Matthews show, I am inspired. And usually the next day I'm playing – and something's coming out that probably wouldn't have come out the day before, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, you, you start hearing the elements of other music, other styles in you guys and your later albums. Is that because I mean, there's a song called Breathing Lightning, which has been yeah, yeah. my jam lately. And there's like Beach Boy esque harmonies on that song. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You know? I mean, we've, uh, you know, back in the day when we were all punk rock, hardcore, metal, you know, we were on a, on a mission, I would say. And yeah. the mission was we wanted to be the, the fastest, the heaviest, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And yeah. that was our goal. And then as you kind of do that for a while, you kind of start to maybe you want to modify it here and there and you want to bring another element into it. And I, I always mm-hmm. said that the best type of cakes I like are the ones that have different types of filling. It's not Uh, just one. So you get that one flavor uh, and then you get that next one that comes in. It's like, that's the way music should be. It's like, mm -hmm. I love these guys. They have that solid base, but then they put something on top of it that just completely just takes it to another, another flavor. (laughs) Yeah. It's probably why you like, you know, you know, comic book movies and Star Wars and everything. Cause it's, cause that's the thing like, you know, with the Marvel cinematic universe, just kind of going off on a tangent here. I like the multi-layered plots that are happening, you know? Yeah. That's, it's that's, easy. it's a drummer thing. I don't know. <clears throat> I, would say. I mean, I think drummers are very, very, you know, uh, you know, we sit in the back for a reason because everybody looks to us, but we're like the guy, we're like the judge. We're like, what, you need something? Okay, come over here. Yeah, I got you. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chef in the and uh, I always said that I feel safest when I'm in front of the drums. Like sometimes I'll play guitar on stage and different, not with Anthrax, but with other bands, I'll play guitar. And I always feel so exposed, just like yeah. no protection. It's, <laughs> it's a weird thing. Yeah, I get it. Well, I mean, Rich, what do you think? Do you like being well, for, behind you? You like for, being out in front of For me, you? I love, I mean, you know, it's like, a, it's what a beautiful mobile office. We've gotten to see the world and hopefully affect people's lives in a really super positive way through that form of expression. But, you know, I, I'm a, my girlfriend calls me a show pony. Like, I want to get out in front of the drums, man. Like, I have a front man's personality. I have the, but I have a horrible voice. So, like, I got into, <laughs> I got into, like, you know, hosting and I'm, I've been studying acting for six years. So, I, I'm always going to be back there, but I want to come out front, man. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I really I do. I can see that, man. 
Yeah, my my radio background kind of encourages that. I, I if I was forced out into the front, if that makes sense. Well, no, Jim, Being you have the here. face for radio. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a butt up, please, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm going to give you the prices right and then the Kelsey Grammer falling off the stage. Oh, good Lord. Okay, there we oh, go. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, drummers, I mean, I love sci fantasy, sci fi. Are you a horror buff? Like, big time? Like, I, yeah. yeah, I love horror movies. Since I was a little kid, I've loved horror movies. Um, yeah. And I think that's why my love of, like, back in the day when, when I saw Kiss for the first time, it was like, my worlds have collided, you know, horror and music. Yes. Yes. And, um, and like Alice Cooper was always cool back then too, you know, but, um, since I was a little kid, I had like four older sisters and I had, um, uh, three older cousins that we would always hang with and everything that they watched, I would watch. So I was exposed to like, you know, the Abbott and Costello movies, King Kong, all that stuff. So I was just like, I love all this. Yeah. Give it to me. And then my mom got me a subscription to famous monsters and that was it, man. I was on my way. Fangoria magazine. Fangoria magazine. Another great magazine. Man. Yeah. Well, it's not like even yeah. the uh, Stephen King novels having an influence on some of the songs. The Stand, especially. Well, you know, Scott Scott's was always such a big King fan um, mm -hmm. to this day. Sure. Uh, it's, it's never left. And, of course, we all love Stephen King. He's like, he's the king, you know. And he loves but, music. Um, and he loves music. Yeah. And he, he's, we've put him on the guest list so many times and he's written us back saying, guys, I'm out of town, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, Steven was a huge ACDC fan back in the day too. And uh, hmm. he likes rock music and he plays and his son, Joe Hill, writes some amazing books too. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a tough shadow. That's like tough shoes to fill. My dad is Stephen King, the most famously published, you know, best-selling author of all time. Yeah, I think I'll be an author too. But at the same time, he's got some, you know, he can uh, be guided through the doors, the front doors of Absolutely. the, you know. Yeah. I mean, if you got the goods, then it doesn't matter who you, who you came from. You know yeah. what I mean? If your stuff is good, yeah, it's good, you know, because there's so many so many offspring you know that have uh failed in either music or literature or whatever but some do click and it's yeah. because they they had it you know so looking back you you probably this probably never gets old but and i hope you realize this but you're probably at a point where all these people you had on your bedroom wall all the posters you're f probably friends with all these people now, at least very close colleagues. I mean, can you call Paul Stanley and say, hey, man, I'm on Sunset <laughs> Boulevard. Let's go get that. Let's go hit that little sushi spot. More Gene, I think. That. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Gene, that's pretty cool, Gene. though. I mean, you're wearing a Kiss shirt and they're your friends now. I mean, that's amazing. I still love them. It's, 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 what they meant to me, like back in the seventies is, is it's never left. That's yeah. the thing. It's like, I still worship them and the Beatles, you know, it's like nice. my favorite. Um, we were at a Grammy award, uh, show, uh, it was a couple of years ago and I took my daughter and during the show, she's like, dad, dad, I have to go to the bathroom. Can you take me? So I'm like, okay. So I, the show's still going on. So we left, but the, um, we had to wait till there was a commercial break. You know, so you have to wait in like the wings. So we're waiting for the, the performance to end. And who comes walking up to us is Paul McCartney. And um, he sees my daughter all dressed and he comes over to her and he pinches her cheek. And he's like, look at you. You look like a little princess. And I'm just standing there. Oh, my God. Like, pinch my cheek. Um, <laughs> pinch my cheek. <laughs> Can I get a hug? <laughs> and, uh, and he's talking to her. And he's talking to her and she's talking back. And I'm just like, and he's like, oh, and this must be dad. And I'm, I, I don't even know what I said to him. I think I said, I love you or, or something. Love you, man. And I just, and then we started talking a bit and then it was just a moment, you know, but, uh, good for you, man. you said before about, you know, you had these posters on your wall and then you get to either meet these people or you become friends with them. Yeah. yeah. If, if it wasn't for this, that would have never happened. I say that so much. If it wasn't for this, yeah. boom, 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 you know, yeah. none, none of that would happen. So. Yeah. 
It's Which interesting, I feel very you know, blessed. It, sure. It's this is definitely something for me to be talking and you know kind of doing a hang with you because I mean you had an unbelievable influence on my playing when I was on so many track. musicians, so many drummers. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, you were playing I'm outside very, of you. Were, very honored. So, you know, it's game changing drumming. So do. But I mean, there's a, uh, I saw you, you remember Tuxedo Junction in Connecticut when you guys used to play, you played there with SOD. Back I in, remember that um, place. Yes. Mid nineties or something like that. And uh, it's caught you guys hanging outside you and Scott. And, and I just walked right up to you. I said, Hey dude, I'm a big fan. And you're like, <laughs> thanks. And I was like, that's it. I just wanted to tell you that. But I mean, dude, to the point, I emulated your your playing, and I even cut my hair when I had hair. Uh, <laughs> when you cut your hair, because it was you were on the cover oh, of awesome. Modern Drummer. I brought it in to my Italian barber. And I said, "Just do that." <laughs> <laughs> that is an awesome story, Jim. It really is. Back I love when I that had story. hair, <clears throat> so the mullet went bye bye. Yeah, and I'm Charlie. We have hair at our age. I love this. This is awesome. Yeah. I'm not me, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I they do, say you look fantastic. Yeah. Well, that, you know, I was going to say well, that that's what I, I don't even know if it's clean living, but it's the idea that that you're you have a childlike energy and that you love what you do and you get out of bed every day with a smile on your face because you get to do it. That's like a youth pill, man. You know what yeah. I mean? I, I think that you could pass for 38 years old, man. I'll, I'll take I'll that. Good. All right. Yeah, 25. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, even, I'm a guy who looks at people's hands. It's kind of weird, but I'm like, I look at, you know, I see your hands and you're, you, you, you make a lot of motions. Your hands look just young. You know what I mean? Especially from the hard playing over, you know, 35, 40 years. Yeah. It's got to be, you know, well, actually probably 50 years at this point. Cause it's not real I mean, work, that, Jim. We love what we do. It's not like we're, dude, you know, Charlie freaking works. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I, but it's funny because I think the work, when we consider it work, the work to me is the travel. Yeah. Is, is, oh, yeah. is the, is that to me is the work. The work is leaving. Um, mm. The, the best part of it, of course, is when you're up there and you're in a zone and, and yeah, sometimes you don't want to play the same song over and over again. So I'll kind of, what they like to call is edit. Oh, you edited the songs again tonight. Oh, yeah, I just got bored with that, Phil, you know? And so you want to make it interesting. Um, yeah. So I am guilty of doing that, but it's only because, you know, you're out there for uh, months at a time, and it's like, if I got to play Caught in a Mosh one more time, I want to change it here, you know? <laughs> so, but, the, but that happens to be one of my favorite songs to play, though. I will say yeah. that. So, I mean, with you writing a lot of the material and bringing it to the guys and it's a very family-oriented band, you know, same individuals for such a long time. Um, if you have a fill that's ha lu 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 la lu 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 and then you want to go ha lu 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 ba do you have the freedom to do it? Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody has the freedom to express however they interpret the, the song. Of course, there's been times where it's like, that's a bit much, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of jumping over on my part here. So, yeah. you know, we'll always talk it out, you know, after the show, do you have like a ever... state of the union kind of like <laughs> after every show where you guys tell like, this is how we can be better or what happened on that tonight. If I tell you what goes on after the show, you'd be like, really? It's like, everybody's looking to eat after the show. <laughs> you know? that, that's what happened. You back in the day, it would have been like, yeah, let's go, let's go do this. Let's go do that. You know? Yeah. And, now, now it's just like everybody's on their phone talking to the, you know, kids or family and what's, what's for dinner and stuff like that. And, you know, so it's shifted, you know, and especially since all of us had, has had families now and mm -hmm. priorities change and maybe you don't really talk to each other that much like you used to, you're off doing your own little thing and then you come back and then. You know, you know how it is. Yeah. I mean, for the early days, for us, I mean, the same group of guys playing together for 21 years. In the early days, you're playing a club. So it's so easy to have a party afterwards because you're already at the club. And then if you're playing you're a, a like a bigger venue, you still we're still young. We still want to mix and mingle. So you're like, all right, let's go from this amphitheater to a club. And then, you know, as my boss got more and more popular and recognizable, it's like, well, we can't 
go anywhere. So now we're just hermetically sealed backstage. So <laughs> cue the fire pit, cue the, you know, let's get a six pack of this. That's the party is here. The Luau. Yeah. Yeah. And usually like uh, the last, was it last summer? We, we, uh, it was like, we had that big tour. It was like us Slayer. Um, uh, God, I can't remember the other band. Yeah. All those bands were out and, it was just like everybody after the show would just kind of get together and you sure. just hang, you know? That's awesome. it, the interesting thing about that is that you have these guys that are just like, you know, angrily thrashing on stage. Then they get off stage and they're all just loving and hanging out. It's like a big commune. I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. That- but there's a lot of hate. There's a lot of hate too. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. you thrash on stage and then you get, go backstage, you call your wife like, don't forget Terminex is coming tomorrow and the landscaper. Okay. <laughs> that's right. But, um, for put the extra part, toilet paper on the Amazon order, please. That's right. Yeah. But like I said, for the most part, after a show, we're all kind of hanging with everybody and just, you know, you, you do that. We, 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 we used to do like meet and greets after the show, but then that got kind of like real tiring. And we felt right. that it really wasn't, fair to do it after the show when you're kind of done so we do them pretty much before the show when we're there's more fire you know that's that's smart yeah i met uh actually i have a funny back when i was back in radio we saw queens i think they were opening we had but meet and greet passes with them and we all stood in the line they, they positioned us strategically and then the band members just kind of came by and it was my turn to talk to jeff tate and i go uh i'm like i heard you were an opera singer He's like, yeah, I'm a classically, classically trained opera singer. I said, what made you, you know, why, why'd you get into rock? And I'm like, realized right there, I'm like, I asked the stupidest question to surround. He, and he literally <laughs> looked at me like, because it was more fun than opera? I'm like, yeah, I'll just go back into my ashtray now. Just, just continue down the line. Forget, forget I even asked. It's crazy. But I mean, you know, when you have those instances, do you get those kinds of people like me that are like, ah, so you're really asking me that question again? do you have it's those instances just, at all it's it, it's happened a few times but yeah. i always feel that um for instance like like meet and greets you know uh or shows when you play a show you have to remember these people have waited to come and do this and they're yeah. so pumped up yeah. that you know you you have to be just as good as you were last night, you know, or yeah. you have to be just as energetic at that meet and greet as you were the day before, Upstate. because this is their yeah. first time, you know, and yeah. you want to make, you want to make their experience the best you possibly could. And so if someone even asks a stupid question, I always kind of say it's cause they're just nervous. They didn't know what to say. Yeah. And you just yeah. kind of politely just kind of make a joke about it and you just move on to it, you know? But I, I never want to, like, I never want to make anyone feel bad, even though back in the day, if you're having a bad day and something does happen and you do do that to someone, you feel really bad afterwards. Yeah. You probably get a lot of gifts in the, uh, in the, in the meet and greets. Like here's the Star Wars figure and here's a, a limited edition Jaws, such and such. I do. Yeah. I do. I, I love those people. And I usually repay the, you know, if someone gives me something, I'm usually giving them something in return because yeah. it's like, thank, thank you so much for thinking about me. And here, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I appreciate it, especially in Japan. That's like, they love giving gifts over there and I, yeah. I love getting them. Uh, yeah. And, um, but yeah, so I, I, I love that when people take the time to think about something that you would enjoy and they give it to you. It's, it's a great thing. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, getting the gifts and stuff like that. And I just completely lost my thought. Oh, it's a, it's a nice perk. <laughs> is that what you're going to say, Jim? It is. No, it's a nice perk, but there was something that you said, Rich, that sparked a memory, but forget about it. You know? Oh yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm one of those nervous fans right now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you know, I, I haven't spent enough time in Japan. I mean, I've been to various cities in Japan, but I mean, in, I definitely want to get to Tokyo. You've probably been a million times. My favorite place seems seems like a if for a for a comic book fan it's like it's Blade Runner man it's it's like every day <laughs> it's Blade Runner it's everything there yeah man. it's like if uh, if we have it here they also have it there yeah I what is your favorite scene from Jaws <clears throat> my favorite scene from Jaws um, yeah. wow that's that's 
that's a tough one because there's like uh the the first scene i think really got to me because it's just you don't see the shark but your yeah. your imagination is going and i remember i read the book so i knew it was happening you know he was just t you know taking pieces of her that that part scared me but the the part that got me the most is the first time you see the shark and that's when mm -hmm. the kids are in the in the bay you know and then you have the guy rowing the boat and he's like hey you kids are right over there and then the shark comes yeah. and knocks his boat over and then you see it biting his leg mm -hmm. that that did me in right away i was like that's fucking scary man yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know we swam in that bay courtney and i oh really you know i was bay, there where they filmed that yeah Martha's Martha's Vineyard. Vineyard. yeah that's right i we went to that exact that location yep. uh, back <clears> in like 1994 uh i took a trip to martha's vineyard purposely to find mm -hmm. jaws sites and when i and um nobody knew anything back then uh and um so i had to find them all myself so i found that i found the tower i found uh i mean the lighthouse uh the actually there was a restaurant and the kid who played alex kittner he was the manager yeah. of the restaurant Little kittner boy and, and they had a kittner burger and uh yeah anyway. and it's kind of that's macabre <laughs> uh my one burger. of my favorite scenes is the um the scene with quint telling the story of the uss indianapolis the monologue yeah yeah that's an that acting class good. monologue man actually it's a lot of and a lot of acting classes now yeah. rumor that has it he was he was really kind of drunk during that scene yeah I heard that. I heard he was drunk yeah. for a lot of that, a lot yeah. of those scenes. Um, but you know, that scene wasn't even in uh, the original script. It, they added well, that It was later. improvised, right? Did they Most improvise of it was that? improvised. It, yeah. it was outlined, and then he kind of right. took that, and I heard, just went with it. Um, I like when Roy Scheider is chumming the water, and then the shark comes up. Yeah, great I mean, scene. Uh, or or, or then when and then the old guy is like falling into the mouth of the shark. That's pretty epic. That's a uh, Quint. That's yeah, it. when he yeah. gets uh, yeah, he chomps down on him. Well, my daughter, I think when she was eleven or twelve, I thought it would be funny to reenact that scene with her <laughs> being the Quint character. So on YouTube somewhere is my daughter. Uh, and my son reacting to her telling the USS Indianapolis and me holding my other daughter is kind of going, where are you getting this from? It's really yeah. Kind of funny. Wow. Uh, That's kind of cool, dude. Yeah. That's cool. We'll put it in the show notes. Why not? Yeah. I'll have to revisit that Jim McCarthy. Have, have you seen that one, Rich? Did I show that to you? I think I saw it the day you filmed it. Yeah. Yeah. Jim has been a, a, a kind of like a muse in my life. Like if I don't, I've known him for probably 13 years. If I stop believing in myself or I'm getting a little down, he just taps you. He's like a little angel. He just taps you on the shoulder and is like, dude, you're good, man. You got the good. Just keep moving forward. You know, we all need people like that. What's the matter with you? In our lives. Uh, like, <laughs> I, like, I like that. <laughs> hey, yeah. so Charlie, obviously you took your drumming influences and you created a whole new style that influenced generations of drummers. Who were your heroes, man? Who, like, was it Peter Chris? Peter Chris was a, was a big hero. I love Peter Chris. Um, uh, his, his drum solo on kiss alive still to this day gives me goosebumps, man. Uh. It's just, I just love it. And, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, you had your drummers that you looked up to, uh, everyone from, I love Buddy Rich too. Uh, uh yeah. um, my, my mom would always wake me, wake me up. Like when he was on Carson, she'd always wake me up and say, buddy's buddy, rich is going to play now. So I would always wake up and watch buddy and then go back to sleep. Um, <laughs> but I loved, of course, you know, Neil was a huge influence on me. Um, uh, Alex Van Halen, loved mm. Alex Van Halen. Underrated. Bill Ward. Mm. Bill, yeah. yeah, Bill Ward is another drummer I loved. And then, then I started getting into like the, the, the Zappa drummers like Terry Bozio. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I think Terry's playing is just phenomenal. You know, uh, Steve Smith, another mm. guy from, uh, journey Dirty. and of course sure. he's gone on to do his he, he steve smith is one of those drummers that every time i see him do something i learn something i was like what the yeah. hell but yeah and the james brown drummers clyde and jabo i i love funk 
funk, 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 funk. Love yeah, it. sure. Yeah. I, I tell the kids, man, go get that that Star Time, that James Brown box set, ah, and play to that dude. shit every day. You know, ah. and it, it's so easy for the kids to practice smart now, like almost kind of like I would say methodically, because they have Spotify, so they can arrange playlists by bands, by drummers, by tempos, by styles. They can really double down. I mean, when we were kids, it was like we were trying to drop the needle and making sure that the record wasn't skipping, and it was <laughs> it was really difficult to do. And now the today's kids, it's just like these crazy kids. It's so much easier. You know? Oh, I see. I see kids on YouTube doing stuff and like things that you, it would take you months to learn. These guys are learning it in days, yeah. um, and it's like, wow, this shit's evolved, man. So it's, it's it's not the way it used to be. And um, I, I mean, technology's gotten better, uh, so our brains have gotten better. We adapt more to to things uh, a lot easier, I think, these days. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. This is The Rich Redman Show. And well, you know, you guys are so accomplished. Am I correct in saying that um, this year is the Persistence of Time 30th anniversary? You got a deluxe edition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that was like, I've been putting that together for about a year and a half and um, it came out a couple of months ago and uh, I was so happy with it and people loved it too. So that's, that's my reward when people are like, dude, this is the best reissue. I was like, great. Thank you. <laughs> now, what did what did you make? Did you remaster the songs at all? So what I did was um, it's all remastered the the mm. main record, but there's also a lot of bonus stuff on it where uh, I would show you how uh, it, it went from my riff to showing the you know showing everybody, and then we rehearse it, and then there's mm. we're tracking it, so it it's like the uh, evolution of the song. So mm -hmm. that's like, that's the, there's two discs and that's the other disc. It's and amazing then, uh, that you had all that stuff available and saved. That I was saved so smart. All. Because back all the in the day, I'm like, let, let me put this away for a later date. Yeah. You that, know? That, um, that's really smart. And the other thing was the album cover is a little different um, because the original uh, design that I had was more like a Salvador Dali uh, um, yeah. picture with a melting clock, but the artist who did it, he didn't put the, he didn't do the melting clock on it. And it was, it was fine. You know, that's the original album cover. But for this reissue, I said, no, I want to do it the way I originally had it. And we put the melting clock on the cover. Ah, that's really how cool. Get, like, how did you get overruled on the clock in the, in the first place? Well, that's what it you went like the, he did it and then we saw it. And there was no more money for him to change it. So I was like, all right, it, 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 it's, it, it's good enough. Uh, you know? so, it. And I knew, like, f future me knew, okay, years from now, I'm going to change it back. <laughs> That's great. And then, uh, you had a video that was like, a, it was kind of like a tour diary video that went with, uh, I want to say, Persistence of Time. And uh, there are some outtakes of, it was either you or Scotty going through the uh, food line. And um, it must have been catering or something. He grabs a carrot cake and he shows it. He's like, eat some carrot cake. Binds you up. You take a good dump. <laughs> what? what? I love carrot cake. You remember that? <laughs> these, are, these are road stories. <laughs> yes. Yeah. These are road stories. Well, you know, I know Jim always, he, Jim always tries to drive home the point of like, you know, being in a band or being a creative is you're, you're, you're really an entrepreneur and you're running a small, yeah. small business owner for you guys. It's a pretty big <clears throat> business, you know, and now you have a team. I'm sure you have, you have a manager, you have a road manager, you got your crew, you got oh, a publicist. Right. I mean, you got people, you got lawyers and guns and money. Um, so yeah. what does everybody, is there like assigned roles in the band where it's like, 
All right, Charlie's going to take care of like marketing and album color covers, and how does that work? Do you is there defined I mean, roles? Since the beginning, I think I took on more of the role of uh, I like the whole do it yourself type of thing mm -hmm. because then if anything goes wrong, you have nobody to blame but yourself. <laughs> um, it's only when things fall out of our hands is when kind of mistakes were made. But for the most part, we all like to, you know, let's all see it. You know, even though if I'm doing the day to day stuff or even Scott's doing the day to day stuff everybody still likes to see what's going on, you know? So that, that's the way it is. Sometimes everybody doesn't see what's going on, but most of the time we do. Mm. But uh, because sometimes I find that too many cooks, just it just ruins the pot, you know? Yeah. Um, so my focus has always been a collective effort. So if, if that picture of myself or that picture of the other guys looks better than mine, I know they're going to be happy. You know what I mean? So yeah. I try and go with that angle. Like I want to make them happy first. You know, the funny thing is uh, getting back to a lot of the people being in the band with Joey Belladonna handling vocals for a majority of the time. Then you brought yeah. in John Bush uh, was at yeah, 92, yeah. I believe. Um, yep. I have to blame you for uh, getting in trouble for skipping school when that album came out. So, I'm putting that, in there. <laughs> that was a that was a good album. I love that. It was a good album. Only yeah. was a great song, man. Great. That's a great song. Great. I love that album. Yeah. Now was John Bush anymore, on the I last wanna... album? I, I kind of almost heard like a little bit of John Bush esque vocals on like that song, "Breathing Lightning." Was he singing uh, vocals no, that's, as well? That's, that's Joey. Is it Joey? Yeah, that's that's all Joey. Yeah. yeah. My Joey's, gosh, Joey's awesome. Iconic metal voice of our time. Yeah. How old is yeah, he? Yeah, he's great. Uh, I don't even know. I I I don't I don't ask people like how old you are anymore. I just like this <laughs> because you know this year I I have this whole thing about twenty twenty. I don't think we should age this year. I think we should remain the age we were for 21 yes and let's just let's just skip this 20 shit do over you know no. Yeah, because I turned I turned fifty. I went out to Joshua Tree. I talk about it on every episode. I got naked and played bongos like McConaughey and looked at the stars. It <laughs> was said awesome. That many times, did Dude, you really get naked? I didn't. Well, I mean, eventually I did. You know, because I had my girlfriend with me. You know, hello outside. Um, um, maybe. Uh, well, you but, you brought it up, but you know, and it ended up being very cool and romantic and meaningful. But at the same time, me being the show pony that I am, I wanted to have midgets and strippers and fire trucks and like. And I wanted to, you know, string cheese. I wanted to do the whole deal. So maybe I'll do, I don't know. I got to do this again, man. 50's big. Yeah. Do 51. Yeah, no, I'll do it at 51. Yeah. All right. We'll do the second annual 50th birthday. And then when I turn 60, you know, I got 10 years, whatever that is, 3,000 days or something. That's going to be a big sucker too, man. It's got to go too. big. Well, yeah, go big or go home. Go big or go home. Come on. <laughs> Charlie, if you had to pick three songs that define the sound of anthrax across this massive body of work, what would it be? Uh, I would pick uh, Madhouse, Caught in a Mosh, and Got the Time. You heard it here first. <laughs> Which right. is fine because Got yeah. the Time is a cover song, right? That's right. Yeah. It's a Joe you guys Jackson did it in song. Your, yeah, Joe Jackson song. Yeah. Getting back, Nobody knew uh, the, the covers. You know, getting back to the influences, we talked about Neil and everything. Do you remember where you were when you found out that he, uh, he died? Actually, I was here and uh, I had heard a couple of weeks prior, uh, I heard some things, but, you know, it's just like, that. Yeah, you know, let's not even think about that. Yeah, yeah. And then... Uh, myself, uh, Mike Portnoy, and Chris Jericho. We have a uh, a group a group texting thing that we we text every day, pretty much, and mm -hmm. we all found out that way, and we were all mm -hmm. just devastated, just devastated by it because man, Neil was so young, you know, he was, was yeah. sixty four, I think, or sixty seven, yeah. I believe. I don't even think he was that old, but I think he was 65. Yeah. 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 It was still young. But uh, yeah, it was very, very young. And then we were talking throughout that whole week and we, you know, we were hearing rumblings about Van Halen back then. 
that we heard he wasn't doing so well either. And then, you know, when Eddie passed away too, it was just that day. It was just like, fuck, man. It's just right. all our heroes, you know, your, <laughs> your childhood, even though, even though they're not like your family, but yet they have this quality of you known them for so long that yeah. they become part of your, your, your family, you know? And it's, um, uh, yeah, it's terrible, man. Losing, losing, losing people has become like, like whenever I see a post that someone puts a picture of some sort of rock star, I'm like, oh no, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you know, not, not again. Or you see yeah. somebody's name trending on Twitter. Oh, I yeah, hate like, it. Uh, little, I mean, little Richard early this year. I mean, it's yeah. just, they're just uh, oh, one yeah. after it was a rough year. It was a, it's it, been it's, a rough year. Like, yeah. Yeah. You're right. Kobe I mean, Bryan it is thing. about oh, Kobe. Yeah. The whole family aspect of it. I mean, when those two passed, I had people from Facebook, people I went to high school with. You're the first one I thought of, Jim. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because I was such a Neil and Eddie Van Halen fan. Two, you know. I mean, the thing about those two were they did more for the for people who looked up to them, like the guitar players and the drummers. They They did more for us than anybody. You know, yeah. it's like... You know, like a baseball player uh, name checking, you know, someone like <clears throat> Hank Aaron or, you know, uh, you know, uh, give me a name, you know, not Babe Ruth. Uh, but yeah, uh, Babe uh, Ruth. Uh, yeah. 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 Mark McGuire. Reggie Jackson. Yeah. Reggie Jackson. Yes. Sure. So, you, yeah. So, for guitar players, uh, Van Halen was the guy. I mean, and for drummers, Neil was, was the guy. Yeah. Neil was like the every man's drummer. Everybody who wasn't a drummer knew who Neil was. Um, Eddie, my brother, is a keyboard player, piano player, and uh, very prolific, very profound. But the 1984 album had a deep impact on him because of all the keyboards and synthesizers used, to which when, mm. you know, shortly after Eddie died, he and I talked, he says, you do realize that nobody has been able to replicate that sound of jump of uh, the 1984 prelude all weight the brass on all weight yeah. it is one of the most hard to replicate sounds i'm going that is so true i mean you can't it's, even they could barely and that was all eddie eddie and ted uh -huh. templeman i guess but i mean it was yeah, just ted, i don't think ted templeman wanted the keyboards but it just they, he got convinced along the way charlie we have we have the <clears> Nash, <throat> in nashville we have this amazing drum community like really amazing world-class players that are all the plan on records and doing these tours and we'll do a tribute every six months or so to you know we've done bonham we've done copeland we've done neil we've done uh so many jeff percaro and halen. we did a tribute to to alex van halen and his drum tech brought alex's exact kit to nashville with the two bass drums you know like glued together you know with the hard beater nothing in the kick drums the snare drum sounding exactly like alex's yeah. i mean i was like holy shit and we all got to play on his tubs Oh, that's awesome. That I love amazing. Alex. Uh, Alex is, uh, as soon as you hear his tone, you just know it's, that's Alex, mm -hmm. man. You know? Yeah. Um, I remember one year, uh, uh, Tempesta and I went to see Van Halen at the Garden, and we didn't have such great seats, and we snuck down. And we, all, we got all the way down to like the third row and we just watched it from there. We were fucking freaking he out. He told us this story. <laughs> he told us this story. So for the listeners out there that don't know, Johnny Tempesta, um, drummer for White Zombie, the cult for such a long time. And you kind of helped him get into the business a little bit. I mean, when you guys go out, would you say that, you know, he's obligated to buy you the slice or what? <laughs> no, no, no. I remember no. what I did we for were, you. <laughs> We've, we've been friends since, God, I can't remember, I don't even know how long ago. It's been like the 70s sometime. But uh, um, I was, I loved his band. He had a band called the Jackals, and they oh, would wow. play this place in Yonkers called the Rising Sun. We would always go see them, and it's just such a great time. And, you know, yeah. we were friends before that. But um, uh, when Anthrax kind of started to take off, I said, I want to get my friends out and, and take them out and, and hopefully get them like a gig. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm. And Johnny came out with us and it was like such a great time every day with him. And then sure enough, one of the bands that was out with us, the drummer got sick. Johnny filled in. 
boom, they loved him so much. He was in the band. That band was Exodus. From Exodus, he went on to be in the band Testament. From Testament, he went on to White Zombie. And then, you know, John John's abilities speak for themselves. He's just yeah. he's a great guy, and he's a fucking great drummer, you know? Yeah. We, 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 we made a promise to kind of visit here sometime soon because we're only a couple miles from each other, but everyone is so sequestered right now. You know, yeah, know. it's going to be really interesting. There'll probably be long lasting effects from this whole thing because when you got to go back, when things get safe enough and you got to go back to your meet and greets, we're going to be going through <laughs> jugs of hand sanitizers, man. You know what I mean? It's Because <laughs> it's, it's already kind of like nerve wracking. I mean, my boss, Jason Aldean, he's shaking so many hands and, and breathing that air and hugging people. And it's like, he's just... With the, with the hand sanitizer, man. I know it was bad when, you know, when we didn't have the COVID thing because, you know, to get sick on tour sucks. Sucks, sucks yeah. man. <clears throat> Just to get up when you're, when you're either throwing up or you got a high fever and you got to play. And oh, it's, it it's tough, man. It sucks. So, yeah, I don't know. I think people are going to be so excited when it really comes back and, uh, we we joke about it and say the first place we want to go is South America because they are just the most passionate, crazy, lunatic fans that you've ever want to play. Awesome. In yeah. You feed off that energy, I would imagine. Oh, it's the best. Like there's, there was, um, as a matter of fact, when uh, we played Chile for, uh, for the first time like years ago and we always said, we have to record a performance here because the audience is fucking better than us, you know? And right. um, we did, we, we recorded a show there and it was just off the hook. And there was times when I was playing, when I just wanted to stop playing and just watch <laughs> because it's like, well, you guys are nuts. You're going absolutely insane out there. Yeah. And it's just a great, they're just so passionate. I, I, I do love the rock church. shows when there's a sea yeah. of people bobbing and it's like, oh. that is just like, that has to feel amazing because, you know, the, the genre that I play, it's, a, you know, there's a lot of storytelling going on and the tempos are usually falling somewhere between like 70 and 120. So there's nothing like super, super fast or, you know, it's, it doesn't happen as much. There's that no has mosh to feel pits good. in country. Yeah. There's no mosh pits in country. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> be, maybe that maybe that's the next iteration of it we got to involve some metal type of things in the country yeah for sure I, yeah it's a good idea <clears throat> that is like idea. maybe maybe the next you know anthrax was one of the first metal bands to cross uh lines and get into hip-hop maybe yeah. it's time to get into country i mean yeah i mean if <laughs> is like that's a colossal charlie's like idea. i don't know man i'm from the bronx i'm not i'm not going past the mason dixon line man buddy uh, <laughs> well, this, have you ever been down to nashville at all and uh hung out down here or recorded at all <clears throat> oh i love nashville uh we had a, we had a night yeah. off uh, a couple of years ago in nashville we went out and hit the town and uh it just was a great, great vibe. Where'd you, know? you end and up? We, uh, Did you remember where you ended up? Like at the Red Door uh, or the Exit Inn uh, or the uh, man, downtown by the Honky Tonks? Actually, it was, um, oh, what the hell was the name of that restaurant? I can't remember it now. Uh, but we, we, we ate across the street and we went directly, we crossed the other street to go to this bar and there was a band playing like in the front window and we just watch them and just drank and ah. there was a there, there's a record store across the street oh it was uh, maybe this. maybe you ate at merchants which is kind of like fine dining on lower broadway and then you could step out of merchants and there's like 30 nightclubs with bands playing in the window it was it was that it was so electric that it's any place you went you were going to hear something fun, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I remember I bought this yeah. Loretta Lynn shirt at this record store and then uh, I was just out all day. Yeah. Kind oh, and you know that. what else? I that was, was uh, see, there was a Rolling Stone exhibit. Rolling Stones exhibit was there too when we played and uh, went to see that. And that was awesome. But yeah, I, it was an action packed day off <laughs> in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to Did think. Did you ever get uh, to oh. uh, sit in with bands? Oh, I would definitely. I mean, not that. not established band, but you know, if you if you were to that. sit in with, uh, oh yeah, the local I mean, band that plays five nights a week, yeah, yeah, I would love to do that. That to me is fun. <laughs> yeah, me too. Doing Unless they call Brown Eyed Girl, you know, they're like, hey, they're going to do Brown Eyed Girl again for the seventeen thousandth time. You could rock that. Song. Uh, Come on. 
I would I would do it in like thirty second notes. Oh yeah, maybe like. <laughs> <laughs> Double time it. <laughs> yeah. All right. What's the key, Charlie, to getting super fast feet, man? What's the key, man? Besides, <laughs> besides repetition and time in the trenches. Like, Let me preface this real quick. Is there is I mean, is Charlie, there a hack? Dave Lombardo I, I and, and you really kind of paved the way for the fast double bass demons yes. out there. But Dave Lombardo famously said of Slayer, "Is like I don't warm up. I just sit down and go." Have you ever heard that? Is that something that's uh, common with you? Or you got to, you know, kind of get your feet going. I've tried so many times getting my feet going, and it's a, yeah, it always flames well, and starts running together. So back in the day, I would never really warm up. I would just get out and play too. And yeah. uh, as time went on, uh, I would talk to different different drummers like like Don Famulero and uh, um, people who had a lot of you know drumming knowledge, and uh, I learned to do things the right way because if you go out right. cold and your first song is a fucking smoker uh yeah. you're not going to play it as good as you would if that song was say 10th you know what i mean mm -hmm. so if you're going to go out and you're going to hit with a fast song warm up you know get get everything flowing get that blood flowing because you don't want to screw up the double bass part and that song when people are like but oh, oh, you fucked it up you know why oh, yeah. he fucked it up? Because, because he didn't warm up. He didn't That's warm why. up. And everybody, everybody's a recording musician nowadays because everybody is filming everything and putting it on YouTube and Instagram. So it's like forever. Forever, dude. Yeah. And uh, like I said, Don Famulero told me that. And Terry Bozio also said, you know what? If you're playing and you're doing the gig and then the next night, you're you're still you're you're still warmed up. You don't need to warm up as 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 much as you did if you had a night off. So I always took that mm. too into consideration, but I still, you know, put on some headphones and I'm just zoning out playing and then let's go, yeah. you know, that type of thing. That's what I do for an hour before the show. No less than 30 minutes. Got to get some diddles and doubles and singles and just get that blood flowing, man. You have to, man. You got to get yourself pumped so that if you are playing, like uh, another thing that, that kind of fucks with me is um, venue to venue, outdoor, indoor. Um, you know, your drums don't feel the same as they did in an indoor place with a nice, the acoustics are nice. You know, you're outside and it, I feel like I'm hitting a couch, you know, it's just dead. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I prefer, I prefer, I like those indoor, you know, I like being an arena band because there's air conditioning, you know, at least Controlled there's some noise, help yeah. there in controlling your, your, you know, your body temperature. And it's from someone that's drinking a lot of coffee, you know, you don't want to have a, that heat kicks in 110 in Phoenix in July and, and, and you get, start getting the runner trots and you're like, what the hell am I going <laughs> to do? I got 45 minutes left in the set. Uh, but yeah, dude, Johnny, that's, that's a tough one. Johnny, uh, you know, he made you that nice little uh, air-conditioned riser, right? Oh, yeah. My drum tech is a very young, forward-thinking young man. And he's like, Rich, I got this air-conditioning unit, and I made these these tubes, and the tubes come up, and they blow 60-degree air all over my drums. It's awesome. It, so then when I don't have it, if, it <laughs> if I trip the power or something, and it's just hot air blowing on my ass, I'm like, oh, my God, get that thing working again. <laughs> Holy cow. You know? Do, do you, uh, it's funny because, like, for me, the, I'm sure you guys have a great monitor, man, too, because yeah. uh, you, have, you have a lot going on when you guys play. Yeah, video and, content and all that. Yeah, and you have to be the guy who, to hear all this stuff going on because yeah. you have to cue it, and you, you know. So if there's a guitar part that you're not hearing, you know, these are things that sometimes it can make the show stressful. When yeah. uh, did I did I miss it? You know, and it's it's, it's a tough one. So the monitor guy is one of the most important things as far as playing a show. If it doesn't sound good, kind of takes it out of me a bit, you know. Yeah. I'm assuming you guys are an inner monitor band, or have you always been a wedge yeah, band? Oh, yeah. Okay, gotcha. I, I switched over to in-ears like the first year that it happened. What I was, was the only like, one uh, who did 99 it. 99 or 2000? Uh, it was earlier than that, actually. Ah. Um, 
and I was the first one in the band to do it. And uh, it took some time to get used to it, though. Sure. You know, it wasn't something that you put on. It's like this is great. It was like, wow, this is weird. You know, mm -hmm. um, but it, believe me, it saved my ears sure. by doing that. Yeah. I mean, we would be deaf as hell. I mean, it's so impressive when you think about bands like Zeppelin that, you know, the song remains the same. They're in Madison Square Garden and there's all that slap back and it's like they played mm. so tight. But then when the editors came along, I tell all the kids, I'm like, look at this thing has shaped at least now two generations of musicians that are used to playing so much more tight because you can hear the pin, you can hear the space between the kick and the bass flamming. And that's going to make you so much more of a better musician as opposed to just yeah. wedges. You're kind of hearing it. It's, you know, it's, 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 uh, uh I was so happy. Like, to wear these and play, it's just, it's a different world for me, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, man. the feel goes but, away. I mean, you have the Rect 11 roots on the seat so you can feel the, the bass and everything. Oh, the thumper. Yeah, we call them the Rect 11 roots. Yeah, the thumpers. Oh, uh, dude, uh, everybody who sits on my thumper can't deal with it because uh, it's like double or triple the amount of a normal thumper because <laughs> I like to, at, at the end of the show, I have to run to the bathroom because Cause it stirs like, everything oh, up. <laughs> yeah but you know it also that sonic that it's like basically a hot air being blown up your patootie it, it could give you hemorrhoids man i was experiencing some <laughs> weird stuff there and i had to turn the volume down a little bit on that thing man i, I prefer to call them asteroids but uh... <laughs> asteroids <laughs> wow my God. Well, Charlie, I don't want to keep you too long, man. It's been w a real pleasure talking to you, man. Um, I, I'm assuming charliebenante.com, anthrax.com. Where can people yeah. get the coffee? Right from those websites? Yeah, charliebenante.com or Dark Matter. You can go to darkmatter.com. But uh, yeah, the coffee's awesome. And again, it's not like I slapped something on in front of it and name. It's like I picked the beans and all that stuff, and it's my blend. So Amazing. enjoy it. Yeah. And uh and yeah, so that's it. And I really appreciate you, uh this. Uh it was fun. Oh yeah, we we owe Johnny Johnny T connecting us all. And now there's one last part of the show. It's Jim's favorite part of the yeah. show. And he's gonna ask you right. a random question. Okay. <laughs> random question, random question, random question of the day. Johnny. All right, here we go. Here's a random question. From the random question generator, literally in front of me. What looks like it should taste better than it does? Looks like it should taste better than it does. Uh, how many seconds on the clock? You could skip and you go to do, another one if you want. We you can, can do a pass if you want. Yeah, you can request another. <laughs> Let's do another one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I couldn't think of an answer either, Jim. If my, I was thinking like... Um, oh, I had an answer, uh, but I just didn't want to say it. Oh, I yeah, didn't want to say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know the line of thinking he's... Uh, yeah. yeah. If money and practicality weren't a problem, what would, you, what would be the most interesting way to get around town? I'm flying flying like a hoverboard oh yeah i would love to, i would just love to fly or my other favorite form of travel would be like on star trek uh when you could just the trans crystallize and teleport. transport and just <laughs> teleport wherever i wanted to go because then touring wouldn't even be that bad it's like show's done see you later yeah you do you guys go sound on. check every day Next. no that's great. So yeah. you have a free day. Well, how do you pass your time? What are you doing during the day? We're busy during the day. Ah, uh, interviews uh, and such like, stuff like that. And you know, we have you know your meet and greets, and then there's just stuff going on. But usually, I love to go out and explore the the towns. Like I, I would always hit like the toy stores or uh, the record stores and things like that, and local coffee shops. I love I love all that stuff. Yeah, me too, man. Well, I'm sure Danbury, Connecticut was a, uh, you know, treasure trove of places to visit when you were there. I love Danbury. I used to go to Danbury, Danbury Mall. Really? Yeah, the yeah. Danbury Fair Mall. 
Well, I remember That's when they right. built it in 86. Um, did you ever get to the East Coast Music Mall? Uh, did that I ring a bell? No. Jim, no one has ever heard like, of the East Coast Music Mall, unfortunately. Dude, they were huge. They were, I mean, they were they were a rock and roll staple. I mean, the guy who ran that place knew everybody in the business. Yeah. Ed Roman. Ed Roman guitars. Ed Roman, he had yeah. his own TV show in Vegas. Oh, of you course. know Ed, right? Yeah. Of course, yeah. yes. Wow. He ran that place. Yeah. That's amazing. And there was uh, all amazing. those characters. Yeah, Jim's a Canadian and I'm a Canadian. I'm from Milford, Connecticut. So you ever get to Milford, wow. Connecticut? It's a cute little New England town with the duck pond and the and church Highline. on the corner. Yeah, Milford High Lie. High Lie. Milford High Lie. It's crazy, man. Okay, so being from that area, I got to ask, in the 90s and such, <laughs> did you pay attention to any of the bands that were kind of making the, the lower ranks throughout the 90s, like throughout Westchester, you know, Fairfield County, even getting into Manhattan? Were you always into like thrash metal bands or did you have a kind of a, a flavor like uh, around the, the no, tri-state I, area in the nineties? I mean, I, I knew a lot of the bands that were coming up and stuff like that, you know, yeah. friends, friends yeah. bands. I remember, I mean, one of the most famous bands that come out of Connecticut was Fate's Warning. There you go. And, uh, yeah. you know, Fate's Warning and Jamie, also, uh, Jamie, Jamie Josta's band, of course, Hatebreed. Yeah. Dismay. You ever hear those guys? It sounds familiar. They were a thrash band. Yeah. Connecticut White Bread. <laughs> that was Jim's band. I, no, I, like, I missed no, them. Never heard of them. <laughs> he missed you, buddy. Yeah. I Jam Syndicate. Band. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Charlie, I'll, I'll thank my, you so much, my man. My line of questioning's over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We slowly phased you out, Jim. So everybody get out there and uh, support the band. Anthrax, Persistence of Time, 30th Anniversary Deluxe Edition. And uh, yes. Charlie, Rock and Roll Royalty, man, thank you so much for joining us, man. And stay safe out there, and hopefully we can meet in the flesh one day. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Have a great night, and uh, let's do this again. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> guys, thanks for listening to this and supporting The Rich Redmond Show. i got an email address for you, Show at gmail.com. If you love the show, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Charlie. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.